So we started off uh, this course by saying this. We believe that any couple can have a good marriage with, first of all, the right tools in the toolbox. Secondly, a willingness by both parties to work things out. And thirdly, a heap of divine help. We started off on week one speaking about building strong foundations. Second week, we spoke about the art of communication, the importance of speaking and listening. On week three, we spoke about resolving conflict. Uh, week four, the power of forgiveness. And we finished that night with that incredible story by Dale and Denise letting him, which certainly had me feeling a little moist eyed. And then last week, Graham and Denise spoke about the impact of family, past and present. And tonight, we're speaking on the subject of good sex. Before we jump into um, that subject material, as we have done on each of these weeks, I'd like to pose a question to you as a group. Well, it's a, it's a double part question. Feel free to tackle both or some of it. But just a question to shoot around the table. What have you learned from this course? And how has this course impacted your marriage? Um, if the answer is very badly, and maybe just hang on to that feedback and we can cover it right at the end. But so this kind of aiming in a positive direction. What have you learned from this course and how has the course impacted your marriage? We'll give that about five minutes, so go for it. I recently read a little story about a dad who was busy trying to get work done and his little girl kept fussing around him. And so he found a picture of a world map in a magazine and he picked it out cut it out into little pieces and he gave it to her thinking it would keep her busy for a while and said, why don't you try and put the world back together? And after a few minutes, she said, I've done it. And he was totally surprised that it had taken her such a short while to put the map of the world back together. And so he asked her, how come you managed to do it so quickly? And she said, it was very easy, Dad. I noticed on the back page was a man and a woman. And I worked out that if I put the man and the woman back together, the whole world would be back together again too. And over the last six weeks, we've been listening, talking, investing in our marriages. And I think the world is very short of strong, healthy marriages. And when we work and we invest in our marriages, it's like the world turns the right, right way up. And the impact that that has on our children on the children that come after them, the generations to come, and on the world around us, the community, strong, healthy marriages. I really believe that God wants to encourage us this evening to continue to invest in our marriages because there's nothing more important in terms of human relationships on this earth, and often our marriages take a back seat. And so a well done for having been here for the last six weeks and an encouragement to keep prioritizing it so that we can get the world back together again. And then also just to comment about prioritizing our marriages is that this subject that we're talking about tonight of sexual intimacy, I um, came into marriage not realizing what an amazing priority that sexual intimacy should be. I guess it's often stereotypically not as much of a priority to women as it is to men, and you might be different. I, I wasn't, um, different to the stereotype, but God gave us sexual intimacy as an incredible gift and actually a very easy way to invest in our marriages. It's often a fruit of a good marriage. A healthy, strong marriage usually means regular sexual intimacy in a marriage, but it's also a gift in that it draws us closer together. I did a study on the physical benefits of sexual intimacy. And just in case you think I'm a freak, it was because I was doing a talk for new moms who were trying to look after babies and feed. And I think that's one of the most challenging seasons for a marriage in terms of sexual intimacy. And so I decided to do this little study. And there were so many physical benefits in lovemaking and in having sex and regular sex with your husband or your wife. And so it really was surprising to me, but one of the major benefits was a hormone release called oxytocin, which is quite a regular hormone. But when a husband and a wife make love to each other, this hormone is released and the actual hormone makes you feel closer. So sometimes 
love making is a fruit of closeness and other times I think it's God's gift to draw us closer to each other. And so that's my encouragement this evening and then I'm going to hand over to the real expert. And I don't have too much more to add. I reckon we can just finish right there. That was good, really, really good. So when we speak about this subject, our view, the, the kind of uh, lenses, the invisible lenses that we wear when it comes to sexual intimacy makes all the difference when it comes to the subject. Every single one of us have got these lenses and they've been pretty much informed by three things as we've grown up. The first one is by our parents. Now, every one of us might have a different story of what our parents were like on the subject in terms of communicating with us. Some of us might have come from families where it was just taboo, it was never spoken about. Others from families where it was only spoken about in a smutty way, kind of uh, jokes and comments that were a little bit crude, a little bit off color. And others might have come from families where it was just an open and honest discussion and questions were answered and was considered normal and healthy part of marriage. I was blessed enough to have a dad who, as we were growing up, sat down with each of his kids and uh, spoke to us, told us a little bit about it. I remember my first um, reaction was just shock and horror when he explained, you know, some of the biology of the whole thing to me. I was geez, stunned. And I noticed the same reaction in both of my boys when I've had this privilege of having a chat with them, just these wide eyes and then uh, some comments like, <laughs> Leva was being taught and his teacher was pregnant at the time. So you could just see him doing the maths and he's like. <laughs> so has Mrs. So-and-so done that? So I'm saying I'm guessing she has. <laughs> it de that develops uh, our view, our lenses of sexuality. Our peers growing up and up till the present day developed that as well. And uh, I went to an all boys high school and that wasn't the best impact on my lenses of sexuality. Everything was just a kind of um, innuendo and smut and crude and all that kind of stuff. And if you're around that too much, the high view of sexuality that we should carry gets seriously demeaned and seriously lowered. And then the third impact on our lenses regarding sexuality is the media and the, the culture that we live in. And uh, maybe I could word it like this, our consumer society. In the society that we live in, by and large, sex is separated from relationship and commitment. It's as if they're two separate things that don't necessarily belong together. We live in a very kind of instant coffee culture, if I could use that um, phrase, where we, we are taught that if you want it, you can get it with regards to most all of life, and when it comes to sexuality, similar thing, well, if it feels good, then surely it is good, and if it, you know, if, it, if, if this is what you want, well, then go for it. There's an assumption in our society as well, our consumer society, that good sex can only be found outside or of a marriage relationship, so in a new relationship, or by having an affair. If you consider many TV series or movies and how sex is portrayed, and uh, movies and uh, series are often a commentary on culture as well as setting culture, most often, hot sizzling sex is the reserve of people who are having an affair or are in an unmarried relationship dating. Married people are stereotypically across um, TV and in our media, usually portrayed as finding sex boring a hassle or a source of conflict. All of this is so far from how God invented it and intended it to be. The, uh, these are four introductory comments that I'm making just in, kind of, in case you're wondering where I'm going with my um, numbering, but sexual intimacy is, or s sex, good sex, is a way of developing intimacy in a marriage, as Jack's alluded to. Now, sex is a gift from God made for our enjoyment within the context of marriage. I'd like to say that again, it, it's a gift from God. God isn't sitting up there saying, whew, 
Look at them, they're at it again. My goodness, how did this all go wrong? He invented it. He designed sexuality. If, if you just think of the, the human physiology involved in, in the act of sexual intimacy, it, it's incredible. He thought it all up. He designed it, he designed it to be within the covenant of marriage and a healthy, life-giving source in marriage. The book of uh, Song of Songs is, is a book about romance. Last night, Grant, who visited from Maritzburg, preached from some of Song of Songs. But listen to how the writer Solomon puts it. Uh, and or it's, this is his, his bride referring to sexual in intimacy. This is Song of Songs 7, verse 10 to 13. I belong to my beloved, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved. Let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved." Now, just in case you thought she was uh, asking for a tour of nurseries or the Namakalan daisies, th this is very, in that context, in that day, this is very, very intimate language. This is a bride whispering in her husband's ear, come, let's go away for the night. And there I will show you my delights. The interesting thing about this particular text is that it's written from the woman's point of view. Again, going back to popular culture, as Jack's mentioned, stereotypically, uh, sex is driven by kind of a male appetite or desire for it. And as marriage goes on uh, for a wife, it becomes, you know, something that needs to be done. That's certainly not what the Bible says it should be like. This is the, the wife whispering these things. I, I can only imagine what her husband's response was like, hey, when do we go? Let's go this evening. This is absolutely amazing. It's a way of communicating love that goes beyond words that God has wired in as part of marriage and it, right in the beginning in Genesis 2, we read this verse on, the, on week one. He says, and a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. The very first mention of marriage mentions this sexual intimacy. I think that one flesh means much more than just sexual intim intimacy, but it's there. It's written about in the Bible. It's got the potential to, um, to grow our marriages, but this is the, I think the good news is that our sexual relationship should be growing as well. Brian, who we celebrated, um, Brian and Barbara, we celebrated, how many, 50, 55 years of marriage. He came to me at the beginning and he said, I hope, you're gonna, I hope you've got a little segment in here for the 80-year-olds um, on sex. So I said, well, Brian, maybe you should be doing the talk because you clearly, something's working. Your wife's got a broad smile. You guys look happy. And um, I'm guessing if you were to, in all seriousness, chat to them, they would say that sexual in intimacy grows and grows as you go on in marriage. If the opposite is true, well, that's very sad. The best sex was right in the beginning. Well, that's just, I don't think how God invented it. Just a comment uh, related to an earlier phrase I made. I said that God designed sex to be inside the covenant of marriage. Our culture kind of looks down on that idea and says, no, you know, if, if you love the girl and you think you're gonna marry her, you know, you kind of, you need to see if you're compatible, see if you could live together with her. The Bible speaks quite strongly about this. And uh, one of the verses that it says is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 to 20. It just says this, flee from sexual immorality. Now, sexual immor immorality refers to any sex outside of marriage. Before marriage, if you, even if you're gonna marry that person, having an affair, any and all the other variants of that. It just says flee from sexual immorality, and this is the reason. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually, sins against their own body. The person you're doing the most harm to, sometimes unknowingly, is yourself. And then Paul goes on to say this, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, you're a, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God. You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, I've had a, quite a few conversations with different people around the subject. I remember one guy I spoke to wanted to punch me 
because I was suggesting that God's word very clearly s- said that he shouldn't be sleeping with uh, this lady. Uh, I've had some people react quite defensively. But a week or two ago, I had a conversation with a couple which was amazing. I had uh, got into conversation with them. They wanted to uh, become members of the church. They were living together and weren't married. And that, that came up just in, by the way, conversation. And the lady said, actually, the main reason that we aren't married is I don't want to. I know that's strange, but we've been together seven years and I've got no desire to get married. So I phoned them a little while later and said, could we meet on Sunday after church? This is two weeks back. So on Sunday, we sat down after our church meeting and uh, I was, I'm not sure how those meetings go. You know, different people have different responses. So I was kind of reading one or two verses and uh, they stopped me. And they said, we knew exactly why you wanted to meet with us. And it triggered a massive discussion. This whole week we've been talking and we realized that there's nothing standing in the way of us getting married. And they said, we want to thank you so much for taking an interest in our lives enough to talk to us about the right way for us to live. And we want to get married. So I said, well, let's come back to discussing that. But this verse says that you've sinned against your own bodies and against each other. And it was the most touching thing as after I'd spoken a little bit, the man reached across the table and took his girlfriend's hand a big strong guy and with tears in his eyes he said I'm so sorry for dishonoring you like this I didn't love you enough to do it the right way and he said and God I'm sorry to you and then his bride to be now because they basically just got engaged here at the table with me with tears running down her face says and I'm sorry for dishonoring you in this way I've never seen somebody do this God's way with regrets. Their wedding is happening on Saturday evening, and I've got the privilege of being there, officiating their wedding ceremony this coming Saturday night. A couple who said, we're going to do things the right way, do it God's way. If you're here this evening, and that's maybe some of your story, uh, you might like to chat to your table leader or one of the elders here at the church, but first thing, is say, God, I'm going to do this your way and I'm going to store up all these rest of these notes on good sex for when I am married and then enjoy it till death do us part as it's meant to be. Sexual intimacy is a vital part of a strong and healthy marriage. It's not just the icing on the cake. When marriage is all going well, we put it on. It's a vital ingredient. It's like flour, water, eggs, etc. in the cake. It's part of marriage. It's important. It shouldn't be compartmentalized out. And having said all of that, problems in marriage can, problems with sexual intimacy can be worked through. Mostly they're emotional problems. Uh, There are, and there's some amazing books that are written from a Christian perspective, um, dealing with some physical problems that do occur. But most problems occur at an emotional level. And as we've outlined through this course, those things can, with time, with energy, effort, communication, those things can be resolved. But most uh, people don't like to go there because it's such a deep part of who we are. It feels a bit vulnerable to talk about these things, to admit that there's been some hurt, that there's been some pain or that we're missing each other. And so sometimes we kind of just keep going and doing life by accident and just hoping for the best. I think we've come to realize over these six weeks that that's never the best recipe uh, for a fantastic marriage. Sexual desire can and must be reawakened. In the busyness of life and as marriage goes on and kids come in busyness and work, etc., etc., it's possible to give it low priority. And it's something that we need to keep paying attention to or else it just becomes part of the drift that happens in our relationship. So when I read these alpha notes after this little introduction, this was the next line. Six qualities of great lovers. So I'm gonna just give you these six qualities as they're written in the Alpha Manual. I'm not pretending to be this by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm very grateful that God did invent sex, as Melville said. I wonder if I could ask you just to pick up the page of the exercise, and we're gonna look at the top block because these six characteristics are all there, and it's gonna be part of the exercise that you do probably in about 15 minutes time. So I'm just giving it to you that you can follow uh, the six um, items as I go down, knowing that you're going to score yourself in a few minutes' time. The first one is communication. 
This one just comes up over and over and over again, doesn't it? Sexual intimacy, good sex, starts with good communication. Now, this is tricky. Uh, another thing that was interesting in the notes um, for this Alpha Marriage course, uh, Nikki and Sila Lee say this, most couples at some point experience difficulty with their, uh, in their sexual relationship. So that's not an extraordinary thing. It's getting through those difficulties, finding each other again. That's what communication um, helps us to do. It's like any aspect of marriage. Good communication helps us to understand each other better. If you are simply leaving it to your, your partner's guesswork as to what you like, what makes you feel like a million bucks? I'm speaking to men and women here. If you're just thinking, well, they should know me by now, that's not a great way to do marriage, let alone have fantastic lovemaking. This, this for me is a, it's ongoing communication because we change, things change, times change, et cetera, and different moments, different days call for different approaches. And, and sometimes when I'm asking Jax, you know, we're trying to communicate around this, she, she says to me, because she knows how my brain functions, there is no formula. Keep asking, keep asking. And in the communication, you actually get closer because it's a way of letting each other know. I really care enough to try and do better, to get this aspect of a marriage working really, really well. There are differences. This is, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that there are differences in how generally men and women approach sex. For men, it's mostly about the destination. For women, it's mostly about the journey. And I suspect that when God wired that all together, he did that on purpose. So that we'd spend more time figuring each other out and more time actually close together. It takes actually a lot of courage to bring things out into the open that are issues regarding sexual intimacy. Uh, very often we can simply think, well, you know what, I just wanna keep the peace. If I say that, <laughs> gee, I don't know what's gonna happen. But anything that's just swept under the carpet breeds there. Just, it's like cockroaches breed in the darkness, the darkest corners of the cupboard, in the dark compartments of our heart. The cockroaches just breed away. And when it's brought out into the light, and we can talk about those things, this is good. That requires an atmosphere of trust. And if your spouse says something to you and you just volcanically blow, well, that doesn't aid trust. Remember back to the listening thing, ask. Don't get all defensive. Ask, talk, talk, talk. And the exercise is designed to help us do that. If you bottle up negative emotion, male or female, it's always gonna be a hindrance to sexual enjoyment. The second quality uh, for lovemaking is tenderness. Going back to destination versus journey, I don't think there's a single wife here who would say, I hate it when my husband's all tender and kind and gentle and loving. I just hate it. Just get on with the job and, and fantastic. I don't think there's a single wife that will respond like that. When we take time over our lovemaking, when we focus on giving to the other person, on bringing them satisfaction, it, it, it puts us on an upward spiral where because we are looking out for each other, looking to bring each other enjoyment and pleasure, it, it kind of gets better and better. We, we're learning, we're growing together. And, and sexual intimacy is, it's never like the movies make it out where it just seems all so neatly packaged and everything all working the same. There's sometimes when it just, I think it's just funny and hilarious that just, I would, <laughs> things didn't work out as we planned. We try, had this idea, one person had that idea, another person was headed off in that direction and thought it was gonna be tenderness and well, we have a laugh and we, we married to each other. We're still gonna be there tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. We've got grace for that. If we can tune into each other's emotional needs, find out where that person's at, resolving conflict first, because when there's conflict, I don't think that's ever a great ingredient towards having amazing sexual intimacy. Uh, this is all helpful. And another thing that is part of the tenderness is non-sexual touch. Now, part of the course that we're not gonna touch on is the five love languages, um, which is a great book that was written by a guy, but he says most of us have a primary language out of um, gifts, uh, physical affection, quality time, acts of service, 
or words of affirmation. If you're married to somebody whose primary love language is physical touch, this non-sexual physical touch, and you're filling their emotional bucket with that, th this is a good thing. When our emotional buckets are full, we do better at making love. The third quality is the quality of responsiveness. Not sitting back, but responding, particularly if it's been part of the earlier communication and part of tenderness. Um, and this is what we saw in Song of Songs. Actually, that book is about responsiveness to each other. Responding sexually can give our partner a sense of confidence. I don't think there's one single person here who's married who would say this. You know what? When, when I make a move, whatever your particular way, method means is her or his emotional bucket was full and I made a bit of a move and they responded. I don't think there's one of us that would say, boy, and they were so terrible when they did that. And I was like, oh, gee, you didn't make me work a bit harder. That we wired to draw close together. Now, here's the thing is sexual intimacy doesn't always start as an amazing feeling, emotional fireworks, etc. If we're gonna sit around waiting for that, I mean, it could be some weeks in between lovemaking, particularly in busy weeks. And this is, this is the thing that I'd like to just, little pebble I'd like to drop in your pond. Lovemaking often can start as a decision and the feelings follow, Get, gets drawn in. If you are sitting back for it saying, well, you know what, I just don't feel like it. I think you could do better. Is to say, you know what, I'm gonna make a decision and who knows where this might head. Sex is an appetite. And one of the difficulties that comes into marriage is when one person's appetite is different to another. Now, for most couples, uh, the husband's appetite is slightly larger than the wife's. If in your marriage it's the other way around and the wife has a massive sexual appetite and the husband's very low, I think on behalf of all the men in this building, we can say we envy you. That's just... <coughs> But a difference in appetite is not righteous or evil. We don't, if you dish up a larger plate of food for one person who's more hungry than the other person, like, oh, gee, look at you, just eating more food again. Will you never have enough? It's an appetite. And so in a marriage, let's say that one person's appetite is that big and another person's appetite is that big. It's a loving thing for the person with the smaller appetite to say, I'm not just going to eat until I'm full, but make sure that the other person has had, is, is feeling fulfilled as well without making them beg, crawl, without manipulating, trading, all that kind of stuff. This is love. This is looking to make the other person happy, fulfilled. Often I've sat with couples and the conversation goes something like this because there's been some kind of awful down along the way. And uh, one of the first places that it shows is with the lack of physical intimacy. And so we'll chat a little bit about that. And very often the conversation will go like this. The husband will say something like this. Ah, oh, my wife, she was, you, oh, oh man, we haven't made love for da, 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 da. She, like, she's so distant, won't even allow me to touch her. And then wife gets a chance to talk and she's like, Oh my goodness, if using the bucket analogy, my bucket is so empty, he's never tender, never kind, never, and just expects me to pitch up. And he's got more chance of, et cetera, et cetera, however that conversation goes, whatever the language is. The, for me, sexual intimacy shouldn't be used as a bargaining tool like that. I've said to some couples, is as the husband is working on being better at emotionally connecting and more tender and all that kind of stuff, I've said to some wives, why don't you just do this as a little project? Just by faith, make love two times a week for the next couple of weeks and see if that doesn't help him feel a little more tender. So he's gonna operate by faith and you operate by faith. When couples have done that, I've never had them come back and say, gee, things went a lot worse. Usually the guy's got a bit of a smile. He's like, hey, I like that homework. This was fantastic. And the wife's saying, you know what, it, there's been a little bit of a change, a little bit of adjustment, because this is designed by God to pull us closer together. Not to just be the cherry on the top, but as I said earlier, be part of the inviting ingredient. Now, here's the 
Here's the thing. Every single human being subconsciously lives with this question. Am I enough? We're asking that, even without knowing it, we're asking that in life. The place where the answer matters the most is with marriage. And if I'm picking up that I'm not enough, there's something weird that goes on inside of all of us that doesn't make us better. And so when it comes to responsiveness, tenderness, when it comes to caring and love making, I wanna let my spouse know she's enough. If you're a wife, tell him, you're enough. That doesn't mean that he's perfect or that she's perfect. Doesn't mean that we don't grow, but that is that you are enough for me. And God put us together. It's a very, very powerful thing in love making. Things that build against that, you are enough, are things like joking about your spouse's body shape. It's like, oh, all big fun and games, but just let them know they might not be enough. A cold reaction. Not tonight, dear. Oh, sheesh, we made love last night and the night before. Like, something's wrong with you. You're not enough. Men, husbands, making a bigger deal out of other women's looks or just in passing comments than you do about your wife. Subtly lets her know you're not enough. These are things that we want to avoid in order to have this aspect of our marriage doing exceptionally well. Fourthly, going down this list, when we'll get to six, we'll break for our exercise. Romance. Romance, I guess, involves creating the setting for lovemaking. Somebody said that the best sex starts at breakfast. Not had at breakfast necessarily, but starts. When... There's communication when there's a, a tone, when it's set. Now, this isn't possible every single day and every single time, but generally, one person in a relationship is slightly more romantic than the other. In our marriage, that would have to be Jackie by a million miles. I'm like, uh, <laughs> what did Graham say last week? I'm, an emotion, I'm a romantic crawler. But when I do something small that's romantic, I know that she could probably cope with me doing something a lot bigger but this is her grace towards me. When, if I make a small romantic effort, she responds to this, She's in, she encourages that. Most often she doesn't say, is that all you've got? Is that all you're gonna bring to the party? You know, just like, she's willing to work with me. And when we're expressing romance in your particular way, whatever your click is in your marriage regarding romance, um, it's, it, it's like you, you're trying to learn the art of what's romantic for that person. And that differs for every single one of us. And when we talk that language, it's letting my spouse know, I love you enough to do things differently than I would ordinarily have it done. And romance involves taking the initiative. Now, Jackie and I have had this conversation. I've said to her, anytime she would like to take the initiative when it comes to lovemaking, the answer is generally gonna be yes from my side. Mark Gungor did a fantastic um, course on marriage called Laugh Your Way to Better Marriage. And he said this, it stuck with me. He said, men, if you suspect like her answer might be, not tonight, dear, I'm not really in the mood. Don't ask that question, are you in the mood? He says, uh, if you always waiting for her to take the initiative and then get all hurt when it doesn't come, he says, you've got that all wrong. He, say, <laughs> he says this, he says, in my marriage, I am the initiator. So I'm not sitting back waiting for my wife to initiate. I'm the initiator. And by being romantic, doing all those other things that we spoke about earlier, it's like I'm putting that on the front burner, trying to figure out my wife's needs, but not sitting waiting, waiting, waiting. Take the initiative. The fifth aspect of great lovemaking is anticipation. Now, our brains, our minds, are the most important sexual part of our bodies. Th this is where lovemaking happens or starts. It, it happens, as I explained to my boys, but I'm presuming you know. Our mind is our greatest sexual asset. And when we at different points communicate our desire, or just in a, in a non-crude, non-demeaning way, let our spouse know you're enough. I'm looking forward to this evening. If it has had 
seriously busy nights and you, you're picking your nights in a week to let your spouse know tonight's the night, baby. I know the last couple of nights weren't there. But some way of letting them know, um, it's building anticipation. It's not just kind of leaving it till the very last thing that happens as an afterthought, maybe perhaps if everything else works out really, really well in my day. In some ways, that's giving each other the dregs. Now, I, <laughs> I'm not trying to paint this idealistic picture, but if, as Jackie said, we make love making a priority, that it's there, it's in our conversation, we're figuring each other out, and we're letting each other know, I'm looking forward to being alone together with you. It builds that anticipation. This is part of healthy love making, healthy sexual intimacy. It's a healthy thing to direct sexual thoughts and desire towards your spouse, even when you're outside of their company. Conversely, it's an unhealthy thing to be directing those thoughts and desires to anybody else. That's bad for a marriage. I, a few weeks ago, was a couple of months ago, was reading a Time Magazine article on pornography. And it was fascinating because that's not a Christian publication. But it was a full four or five page article that researchers had done on the negative effects of pornography on, in this case, particularly men having sex, normal sexual relationships. And what they were saying is what I reckon the Bible's taught for thousands of years, is that when sexual desire is unhealthily channeled like that into pornography or any other expression, what happened to a whole lot of these guys that they interviewed is that they lost the ability to make love in a normal way without that kind of external stimulus or arousal. It had just it had messed with their wiring of their normal of their brain. Now, every single one of us, and I'll come back to this after the exercise, but every single one of us have got the ability. Uh, what's the word? Let me use the exact words that I wrote down here. All of us are vulnerable to thoughts, desires, emotional attachment, sexual attraction to people other than our spouse. That's part of our wiring. Martin Luther put it like this. He said, you can't stop a bird flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest in your head. So an initial thought of attraction that goes towards somebody else, that, it's kind of how we, it's a little bit of our wiring. That's the bird flying over the head. But if I continue with that thought, then it becomes sin. And more than that, becomes unhealthy in our relationship. So one of the best gifts that I can give my spouse is a commitment before God who knows my thoughts to the best of my ability to keep my thoughts uh, in this area and at her and vice versa. Pornography, just on that one thing, pornography is, is such a killer. It's addictive. The fact that our culture says it's normal and it's healthy couldn't be further from the truth. When we were kids, we used to sing this song that said, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little eyes what you see, because the Father up above is looking down in love. Be careful little eyes what you see. And for some, it might be hardcore porn, but for others, it might be movies that they've just got kind of a regular age restriction. You think, well, I'm older than that. This should be fine for me. But the content, the graphicness of sexual imagery portrayed in that is just bad triggers for you. Don't wait for an age restriction that's your age. Just say, this isn't good for me at any age. I'm not going to watch this kind of stuff. I'm not going to be triggered by those kinds of publications or by those kinds of pictures or by those kinds of websites. And then finally, on this um, list of six, is variety. Familiarity breeds complacency. It's easy as you get to know each other, know each other's rhythms and habits, just to get complacent and just to be familiar when it comes to lovemaking. And provided it's been communicated and provided it's part of a healthy relationship, some variety, some mixing it up. We got given a candle tonight with a slightly different scent there. So a gift from that couple to you in this regard is can increase romance, helps keep this area alive, where it's not just we're doing this by rote, we're doing this like we've always done it because it always worked like that. We're looking to, to be creative, to be romantic, to be talking, and to be making it seem like the other person is a priority to us. All of this, these six things that have been written down there, lead to and help an atmosphere of great lovemaking.
to um, bring, it, bring this course in for a landing with two things. First of all, just to speak for a moment about protecting our marriage. Nobody wakes up one morning and thinks, today I'm going to destroy my marriage and lose everything that I've built up all, over all of these years. It only happens, it usually happens as a process. The process of unfaithfulness in a marriage usually starts when we are not meeting each other's emotional needs. And so you'll notice a lot of the emphasis of this course has been on keeping each other emotionally fulfilled, emotionally connected. And it, it's almost like there's a plea inside of my heart just to, to keep your eye on that thing uh, in the context of sex, but of the whole of marriage is make sure that my spouse's emotional needs are being met. When we're busy and miss each other, we find time to uh, figure this thing out again. When it comes to interacting with uh, people of the opposite sex, one of the best gifts that I can give to my wife and that she can give to me is this, is an acknowledgement that every single person is vulnerable. People that have got far higher spirituality than you or I, people with longer marriages, deeper relationships, etc., have ended up in trouble along the way. Sad stories um, if you unpack some of those details. So if I say it will never happen to me, well, that's by God's grace, I hope it won't, but every single one of us is vulnerable and that acknowledgement is actually a gift to our spouse to say, you know what, I'm vulnerable. In relating then to people of the opposite sex, I'd like to suggest that we try and make it a rule to never cross the line of exclusivity. And what I mean by that is getting into deep, uh, connecty type relationships with somebody of the opposite sex, particularly um, conversations that we'd feel awkward if our spouse was there, or conversations that we're not having with our spouse. Even one of those starts drifting towards the line of danger. Might still be a long way away, but just starts pushing us there. Jax and I, have given each other this freedom. If there's anything or anybody that she just feels anything about, she's free to say it without giving a whole lot of reasons and without me getting defensive, just what do you want me to change and vice versa. Uh, we want our marriage to work by God's grace and we know it really is a lot of His grace or completely His grace. We want to give the opportunity to each other that if there's something that I say, you know what, I, I would just prefer you not to dot, 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 that I don't have to come with a list of 30 reasons. She says, no problem at all. I don't think it's, there's any grounds for what you're saying, but no problem and vice versa. Or that we discuss a little bit, but not with that defensive kind of antsy tone. Another thing that it's just been a resolve that we've done in, in our relationship, um, I'm not saying this should be a rule for everybody else, but it's just one of our commitments to each other is that to the best of our ability, we won't be alone with somebody of the opposite sex. Our office windows here at the church have all got big glass panes in them. So if we are having a meeting, if I say alone, if I'm having a meeting with somebody, it's usually work-related, and anybody walking past can see through the window. I generally won't give an, a lady a lift anywhere, wouldn't be alone together with another lady in the car. Not as a legalistic kind of thing, but just out of a desire that this exclusivity keeps like that. The comment that I would like to make is that if you feel you're developing feelings for somebody else and they're growing and it's getting to, it's becoming problematic, find someone to talk to. Break the bubble. The bubble of secrecy is where the devil loves just to operate and deal in all kinds of temptations and those kinds of things. We don't want to live anywhere close to those lines. We want to protect our marriages and keep intimacy alive. And if you have drifted, and over these six weeks, hopefully we've been putting tools in the toolbox. We just need to get back really to basics. The stuff that we did at first, going on dates, talking lots, asking questions, finding out where that person is. These are the things that keep our marriage alive. And in closing, we've spoken along during this course about the incredible part that God plays. He invented male and female and he made marriage. And the way I'd like to close this with group discussion is by talking about our journey of faith. And so at the beginning of this evening, we spoke about our journey of marriage. And of the last 10 minutes, I'd love to talk about our journey of faith. And it's possible, maybe one or two people are seated here that last week when I invited you to raise your hand and respond, you've never put your faith in Christ. 
You might not have responded last week, but in your group discussion, you might say to your table leader or to your group, you know what, I'm ready to take that step of becoming a Christ follower. I think it would be their greatest privilege to lead you in a prayer that just says, God, I'm sorry for the way that I've lived. Please forgive me. Uh, for a lot of other people, you already are Christ followers. So the, the question in finishing off is, where to from here? Uh, I've got a good idea of, um, in terms of, so where to from here relates to, in terms of your spiritual journey, what are your next steps? You might have discussed joining a life group at the beginning, uh, might have discussed greater church involvement, spiritual involvement, etc.